Welcome into the install with Greg Cosell of NFL Films. I'm your host, Buck Rising, alongside the man himself for another week. Greg, it couldn't have been a more interesting uh, week seven, and certainly in the AFC. Seems like things got shaken up at the top of the standings, and it's going to be uh, interesting to see how this continues to play itself out. Well, Buck, did you tighten up this week? <laughs> uh, their their defense certainly did in the uh, – over the course of that game, it's tough to keep Patrick Mahomes from scoring even a single touchdown, Greg, but they managed to to work some magic on Sunday at Nissan Stadium. They sure did. I mean, it's pretty interesting that they've just beaten the Bills and the Chiefs back-to-back games. Uh, so that was that's that's pretty fascinating. But sure. it was very, you know, it's funny, just to jump in, because you, you mentioned the defense, and they really had a, a, a very defined defensive profile in this game. And they played sub-defense because they had 40 snaps of nickel with five defensive backs, 25 snaps of dime with six defensive backs. They only played three snaps of base defense in the entire game. They had a four-man pass rush. Yeah. They did not really rush five. Um, Now, sometimes that four-man pass rush was what we call zone exchange, where the fourth rusher might have been Molden. Uh, or a linebacker, molded more often than not, but it was still a four-man rush. So he was not a fifth rusher. He was the fourth rusher, and they would drop out a D lineman in underneath zone coverage. And they played a good percentage of zone coverage featuring split safety. They did on occasion play some cover one and some what we call one robber, which is a form of cover one where they spin down one of the safeties right in the middle, and he's called a robber or a lurk defender. But it was very defined. They didn't deviate it from that very much at all. So they went in with a specific plan. That's what they did. It's When when you're describing that, and when I watched it, Greg, I had their, their defensive game plan against Buffalo kind of in the back of my head because it seemed like they took a similarly, similarly consistent approach to the ways that they were creating pressure with four, whether it be with Molden or a linebacker coming on those zone exchange right, right, pressures right. like uh, like we talked about last week. Uh, and it seemed to certainly bother Patrick Mahomes behind an offensive line that seems to not necessarily excel in pass protection the way that Josh Allen was able to kind of make some plays despite having that pressure in his face. What did you make of the pass rush in this particular game and how Mahomes really wasn't able to find ways to combat it? Well, it's interesting that you say that. Winning, as they say, is a deodorant, you know, and and cures everything. So they beat the Bills, but they did not really stop uh, Josh Allen. Right. They did stop the Chiefs. So it's it's two different situations. But because they did beat the Bills, people think, wow, the defense was great. But you're right. The profile and the template was somewhat similar. Um, Patrick Mahomes, and I believe we spoke about this last week, and I think it's it, it, I've been talking about this since basically week two, and I've noticed, you know, this past week after the game Sunday that a lot of people want to join my party now. Um, <laughs> but I've been talking about this basically since week two about Patrick Mahomes showing far too much unnecessary movement, not being particularly patient in the pocket, not taking throws that are there. Um, he's waiting too long for intermediate and downfield throws so he's therefore a beat slow to eliminate and isolate and by that I mean to eliminate what's not there and isolate what is there within the structure of the play design Uh, so two things happen when that occurs you either move or you get stuck in the pocket and both are kind of happening with uh, Patrick Mahomes so they happen to catch Mahomes and this offense at a time that they're not playing particularly well But the other factor is, and I've spoken to people who know far more about offensive line play than myself, but this is an offensive line for the Chiefs that's really built more to run the ball. This is not really a pass-protecting O-line, particularly on the edge with Orlando Brown and Mike Remmers. Mm -hmm. So they're also having some issues there, and I'm sure what's happening with Mahomes, I'm not in his head, but my sense is just from interpreting what the tape shows, Buck, is he's probably anticipating pressure and perceiving it because he's anticipating it. Sure. Um, So I think that that's part of the problem as well, but Hey, the Titans don't care about that. You know, they, they they played him 
they, they were on the schedule week seven. You know what? That's when the game was. Yeah, absolutely. And they handled their business uh, in, in that kind of fashion. I, I guess, Greg, just to kind of stick with the Mahomes situation right now, because, you know, I mean, we get into these, we, we everything leading between the games is basically an infomercial to get us from one game to the next across sports talk uh, and sports media. But at this point, it seems like people are trying to or looking at Patrick Mahomes and saying the issues that he's kind of, kind of displaying right now are not that different from the way that he's approached the game in previous years when he did have adequate pass protection. It's just that he seems to be much more un- unlucky, for lack of a better term, with the turnovers that he is uh, that he's giving up right now. How much how much of that perceived pressure is new, or how much of it is, is just Patrick Mahomes doing what he's typically done and not having the same kind of margin for error that he's had in years past with a better line? And I think there's two sides to that. He's done this so well, and by the way, he did this at Texas Tech, yeah. which is one reason why the year he came out, I had numerous conversations with offensive coaches at the Combine who were a little nervous about drafting him. Now, you, we can look back now and say, oh, all those coaches were wrong, but there was a concern that Patrick Mahomes would play too much outside of structure. And while we've seen in the NFL that there there has been no one better doing that over the last, is this his fourth year as a starter? Yes, I believe. That sounds um, right. Yeah. So while there's been no one better doing that over the last three years, there is still a random element to playing like that once you step outside of structure. So he's done it so well so many times that I think we tend to think that, Oh, you know, that's, that's just the way it's meant to be, but it's not really the way it's meant to be because you're playing outside of structure. Now, is there some structure in the sense that when the quarterback leaves the pocket, you coach where receivers go? Yes, but you don't know exactly what the defense is going to do. So as I said, there is, somewhat of a random improvisational element to it and there are times that doesn't work so whether you want to call it unlucky whatever you want to call it over the last four or five weeks it's been much more of a struggle than it's ever been but one thing tactically that has shown up on tape just so people are aware is we're seeing more and more defenses playing either two-man coverage which is a man version with two deep safeties or just split safety, taking away the vertical throws, especially those throws to Hill when he is aligned inside in a trips formation. So what's happening now is when Hill just tries to run across the field, he's not running away from anyone because there's a safety sitting there. Right. So my guess is, Andy Reid, it's not his first rodeo. They'll probably figure this out. Mahomes is obviously a great player. So I don't expect that this is the the end of Patrick Mahomes. You know, it will, that will not be the case. But they're just going through a rough spot where they've got to figure some things out and kind of, you know, re- ref- refresh a little bit, you know, hit the refresh button. I mean, you've just taken away my first take headline, Greg. Here I thought the Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs were dead and, dead and buried <laughs> and gone, uh, seven weeks into the season. This is much less uh, much less exciting. But actually, it's interesting to see the way that it's played out through this point in the season. It's going to be more interesting to see the way that, as you've described, Andy Reid and that offense kind of adjust to, to the way that defenses are playing them. Let's let's kind of flip the script and look at the Titans offense yep. against this Chiefs defense because we, we knew what the Chiefs defense was. We knew their struggles coming into the year. We know that they've been banged up. Chris Jones did play for the first time in a couple of weeks, and it seems like their the entirety of their game plan, Greg, was almost dedicated to selling out to stop Derrick Henry, and they limited his efficiency but allowed the, uh, the Titans offense in that play-action passing game to t- kind of take advantage of well, Derrick as, as a decoy, for lack of a better term. Well, it wasn't a decoy per se because he had 29 carries. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the point that's being a, That's is, just any Sunday, Greg. Any right, Sunday right, 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 right. Um, the point being and I know we spoke about this earlier in the season when they were not getting any explosive plays on offense. That was what was missing. You know, ever since Tannehill took over week six in 2019, one of the things they've done well is execute intermediate and vertical throws with off play action. And in the second half against Buffalo and last week, we're starting to see that dimension of their offense come to the party. And I think when that happens, 
that's when they score points. We know Derrick Henry is great. There's that, That's not the issue. Yeah. And we know that he can break off a long one. Okay, that's he's one of those rare backs that can break off the 60 yarder. You know, obviously he did that against Buffalo. Uh, he had a long one earlier in the season. I forget who the opponent was. Um, Seattle. Seattle, correct. Um, but that those are not going to happen every week. Percentage wise, the more explosive plays come out of the passing game. So it's how do you get to them? The best way this Titans offense gets to them is with the play action pass game, whether they work the middle of the field or whether they work one on ones on the outside, as we saw this past week with A.J. Brown. So that needs to be part of the equation for this offense to to be what we know it can be, given that they averaged over 30 points a game in 2020. So this is a very positive sign because you know what? Henry will have games like this as great as he is. Teams are going to sell out to stop Derrick Henry. They're going to keep him to games where his long run is 11 yards, and that's going to happen. The offense can't be shut down when that happens, Buck. Right. Yeah, and and that's that was a part of their struggle, as you mentioned, at the start of the season. So with with what you're seeing from, from the Titans right now, Greg, as they start to get more of their personnel available to them, we saw A.J. Brown and his contributions – Julio Jones, certainly in the first half, but they've basically robbed more. The wide receivers coach was pulling Julio back by the arm on the sideline to keep him from going in the game in the second half as they try and manage their way through this hamstring injury. How have you seen a change in, in the, in the personnel groupings that the Titans are now trending towards with more of their skill position players available? As we discussed last week, a lot more 11 personnel than we'd seen from them in uh, previous weeks. Yeah, and, and, you know, it's funny you say that because they didn't really – I'm trying to remember, but they didn't really run the ball much out of 11 personnel, particularly on first down. And actually, they ran the ball very poorly out of base personnel, which is something you don't see very right. often. Henry, out of base personnel, meaning anything but 11, he was only 18 for 49. They could not really run the ball the way they want to run the ball. So – I'm very anxious to see going forward what their personnel package is in the run game, because if Jones can play and I know they're trying to manage him and my guess is he'll go this week. um, If they have Brown and Jones, um, it's going to be very interesting to see how teams play in 11. If it's 11 personnel, particularly on first and 10 or normal down and distance situations, it's hard to know because we haven't seen a ton of, of Jones and Brown on the field together to really know that. Um, Like, I'm very curious to see what the Colts do this week. You know, the Colts have had some injuries. I'm I'm curious to see how they play, you know, just from a a personnel perspective. Yeah. uh, I'm I'm looking forward to to getting uh, some insight on the Colts tomorrow with Rick Venturi. He's going to be on the radio show and he always has great insight as to as to what's going on with that team on there as a part of their radio broadcast team but that let's let's look at the Colts because they obviously get right against the 49ers they're trying to they found ways to kind of stop the slide that they were on earlier in the season it seems like Frank Reich and Carson Wentz even even though he is still having those turnovers and and some of them particularly unsightly they well, seem when, to have, he only had one turnover well, the the one that the one that I'm talking about is uh, it was, a, was 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 an extremely bad one. Yeah, but he but he just had the one. Yeah, and overall, he's not turning it over and he's not getting sacked overall. Well, and so let's start there. How how big how much of a difference is that? Obviously, he was playing uh, playing the the Titans in the first game that they saw each other with two bad ankles. His, right. mo- his movement was uh, his movement was severely limited. They tried to do what they do in every game, which is establish the run with that stable of running backs and a and a, a pretty solid offensive line right now that they're trying to get back and get healthy. How have things kind of settled down for Carson Wentz and the Colts? Well, Wentz over the last month or so has actually played pretty well. I mean, look, he's he's in a situation, this is all perception, and I don't deal with that, but just to make the point, he's in a situation where he's going to have to, you know, go deep in the playoffs or get to a Super Bowl before people start to think he's a good player again, sure. because in the minds of many, he just stinks. So it, does, it almost doesn't matter what he does, but that's perception. But he's been playing particularly well. Um for the most part, they're a team that's that's trying to create some balance with their offense. 
this past week, maybe it was weather related because obviously for those who saw the game on Sunday night, it was obviously not ideal conditions. A little sloppy. They, yeah, this past week they played with two tight ends, a significant percentage more than they had through the first six games of the season. So we don't know if that was just either a philosophical change a change specific to the Niners or a weather related change. So we don't know the answer to that until they line up and play this Sunday against the Titans. Um, But um, getting back to Wentz, he's been far more efficient. The ball's coming out. He's been far more accurate. His ball placement has been good. Um, So he's playing at a very consistent level an efficient level and capable of getting the ball down the field for sure. So, and they have a good run game and Quentin Nelson is back. So this, this offense does present some issues. Uh, Certainly. And, and uh, I I think it's going to be a lot of fun to see how the Titans go up to Indianapolis this weekend and, and try and handle, uh, handle this uh, as an opponent. Cause this is, I mean, this is the biggest game of their season, just as they try and uh, secure the AFC South first and foremost, before they start thinking about anything else, if such, uh, such opportunities are available to them with, with the defense though, Greg, and I don't know how much of this was a product of those sloppy conditions um, that they played in San Francisco with on Sunday night, but it seems like they're struggling to, to get after the quarterback or at least not generate pressure, but to bring him down. I wonder, I wonder what are you noticing from Matt Eberflus in this defense right now? Because it's not like they're having outright problems, but that's something that I think has crept up as, as you watch them more and more on tape. Yeah, I mean, and they also struggled a bit in the with their run defense, particularly through the early part of the game. So one of the things that ha- I've noticed is they've played a lot more man coverage this year. I think most people who follow the NFL, particularly with the Colts over the last couple of years, think of Matt Eberflus as a lot of split safety, more zone-based. They are playing far more cover one, which is... M- Uh, single high man coverage they're playing snaps of two man and they're doing that a lot on third down so this is clearly a case where Matt Eberflus has made a little bit of an adjustment and evolution in in the way he's playing this season Um, I can't say why he's doing it but he's clearly doing it because that's what the tape shows yeah Uh, I I I guess I don't, I don't know how we don't know how much of it is a product of, of what they've got as far as personnel is concerned, because obviously in this game, they lost Xavier Rhodes in pregame warmups and, and he is uh, he his consistency. It's not been a consistency issue as far as his playing is concerned, but he's just not been available to them as much as I'm sure yeah, they would and, like that. To and be. obviously, Justin Blackman is now out. They, he was out, of course, for the Niners game. But yeah. He's out for the season with the torn Achilles. So uh, Andrew Sandejo, who's. You know, it seems like he's been in the league for 20 years, but wherever he is, he seems to get snaps. And, you know, obviously he's a guy that teams always want to replace, but you can line up and play with him. So, you know, he is now the the, the back end safety for the most part because they do play a lot of single high now. And uh, Carrie Willis is the is the box safety. So, um, you know, that that obviously is a downgrade because Blackman is a, is a very good player. Yeah. Uh, well, this is going to be my favorite part of the podcast because I know Greg is incredibly excited to talk about what the Bengals offense ah. was able to do against the Baltimore Ravens. I mean, Greg, I, I'm just going to make it easy on you. I'm going to toss it up and say what most interested you about the Bengals just absolutely you know, wiping the floor with this Baltimore defense at home on Sunday. I, I put on the Bengals offense. OK. And, you know, it takes me time to get through these games, you know, I, I never get through every game every week. It's it's just not possible for me. And then because I actually watch these games in great detail. And as you know, Buck, I take really detailed notes. And I just started watching this game on that side of the ball. And after a while, I'm like typing and typing and typing. And I'm fascinated by what I'm seeing yeah. because the Bengals went in with a really d- defined game plan. The one thing they were not going to get beat by was pressure. They were not, protection was their number one priority. So when they got into certain situations, particularly on third down, but not just third down, they would keep a back and it was usually P Ryan and the tight end Uzoma in the backfield. So they would literally have seven man protections because the Ravens, what they do is they are so good with all these multiple front looks where they have six or seven people essentially on the line of scrimmage. 
And obviously not all of them come, but you don't know who's coming and you don't know who's not coming. So you at least have to be in a position to pass protect. You can't guess and you can't always put it on your quarterback to just take care of a free rusher because that's too hard. That limits your pass game. And if you talk to offensive coaches, Buck, they will tell you one thing. You do not have a pass game if you can't protect your quarterback. Right. So they made it absolutely certain that they were going to protect the quarterback. And the other thing that really stood out to me, two things. Number one, there was some form of pre-snap movement on the, literally in the first half on always on almost every play. Yeah. And they, they didn't do it quite as much in the second half, but that really stood out. Um, and this had been a team, the Bengals on offense, that had been in empty sets the second most in the league behind Matthew Stafford and the Rams. And in this game, and this gets back to the protection issue, they were only in empty sets twice in the entire game. And that played into the fact that they were not going to create a situation where the Ravens could get a free rusher at Joe Burrow. I I mean, it was clear that that was their plan to try and get Burrow off his spot. I watched the condensed version of that game uh, this morning before, because I knew we were going to have this as a part of our conversation today. I mean, I I understand that Jamar Chase is is performing at an incredible high level, and it's not just him. They have a really fun collection of skill position players in Cincinnati. Um, But with, I mean, he averaged over 25 yards a catch on Sunday, Greg. What what were they doing with Jamar Chase to kind of maximize his skill set? Because obviously he's an incredibly talented player. You know, they didn't do anything special. They ran a lot of slants. Um, Humphrey ended up being the matchup mostly in the second half, but it wasn't a defined, Hey, Humphrey's the matchup. That wasn't the way it was. Humphrey got beat a number of times. And for people who maybe didn't see the game or watch the tape, like I did, they might think that that matchup existed all game, but it didn't. Right. Um, but he did beat him when, when a lot, when he was on him, but it wasn't as if he ran, things where you went, Oh my God, that's weird. You know, he ran, they ran a lot of basic stuff. Um, and they just, they ran it well. Um, one thing that was fascinating to me, Uzoma had a 55 yard touchdown. Okay. That came on first and 10 on the Bengals fifth possession of the game. And it came on their first and it might've been their only snap, but it was definitely their first snap of what we call 13 personnel, meaning they had one back and three tight ends on the field, and the only wide receiver was Auden Tate. And so the Ravens, of course, matched up with their base personnel, and they, in fact, had Humphrey on Uzoma, and Uzoma beat Humphrey on a corner post. And so it was very interesting to me that that was a designed shot play, and when you call a designed shot play and it works, normally you feel pretty good about how the game's going. Yeah, no, they certainly they certainly should have because – after the Bengals started that that game, punt, field goal, punt, punt, they scored on six of their last nine drives throughout the remainder yeah. of that yeah. game. What, Greg, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, and then they had the runs at the end, which they weren't anticlimactic because it wasn't as if the game was totally out of reach, but it just had the feel of like, well, this game's kind of over and now they're just piling on. But it really wasn't that way based on the score. It just yeah. had to, they just the game had that feel. So, Greg, just to kind of quickly look at the Ravens' defense, uh, they're the third team all-time to allow three 400-yard passers in their first seven games. What, are you seeing something in particular that's allowing those uh, those opportunistic uh, quarterbacks or passing games to wow, take advantage of the secondary? I'm trying to see who have they – well, I, Mahomes must have done it, right? Yes. Well, Mahomes is one of them. Burrow is the other, and I had – I'm looking the, at the schedule third in front of me let me see if i can pull that up really quick. carson wentz carson, carson wentz. Look, look at carson wentz carson wentz yeah yeah um well i guess the way i would answer that and is there's never one reason you know it's i mean some teams you can look at a team and go oh they just can't rush the quarterback i mean sure. when we would look let's say at the titans last year we would always say you know boy they're not really rushing the quarterback and they're struggling on the back end you don't really say one thing in particular with the Ravens. So I think there's multiple reasons for that. I mean, look, when, when Jamar Chase goes 82 yards for a touchdown on a play where he should have been stopped for 20 yard gain, you know, that adds 60 more yards, right. you know? So it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, say, Oh, well, I mean, that's what happened on that play. 
I can't remember the Mahomes game real well, but they they normally um, they normally uh, you know put up. They haven't been in the last couple of games, but normally they do put up a lot of yards passing. Um, so no, there's not one single answer to that. So I, I, I don't. I'm not going to make something up, but there's not one single answer. Sure, I just thought it was a curious yeah. stat. Uh, it is a curious stat because normally they're they're a really good pass defense. Yeah, no question about it. So uh, this the the biggest game this weekend, it seems, Greg, just from an objective standpoint, is the Cardinals, uh, the Cardinals and the Green Bay Packers. Um, I know that you, I, I, I'm sure this is going to make. Well, I guess it's not going to make an appearance on the matchup show because it's Thursday night. No, football. it's Thursday night. Yeah. But what? What? Uh, just generally, what? What are your kind of observations about where these two teams are right now and how this well, might play out? I think one thing you're going to see in this game, because we know that uh, Devontae Adams. I mean, I, I think we're pretty certain that Devontae Adams and Lazard are not going to be playing. I, I, you know. I think you're going to see Aaron Jones line up at wide receiver in this game on a, on a significant amount of snaps okay. because he's capable of doing that. And they have a back in AJ Dillon who as Tennessee fans will remember in the oh. snow in green Bay had about 27, 28 carries. So we know that AJ Dillon, depending on how the game plays out, can certainly carry 15 plus times, you know, he's built that way. So it would not surprise me at all to see, uh, Jones, Aaron Jones, line up you know, a meaningful number of snaps as a true wide receiver because he has that ability. The other thing I want to point out, because I've been watching the defense of the Cardinals quite a bit, and, you know, they drafted Isaiah Simmons in the top 10 at a Clemson last year, yeah. and he struggled early. In fact, through the first eight, nine weeks of the season, he might have played 70 or 80 snaps total, and then all of a sudden they started to use him. And I got to tell you, with a regular offseason – you turn on the tape of this defense, and Isaiah Simmons is a dynamic player. He's ever they use him in multiple ways. He shows up. He's long. He's athletic. He's fast. He can cover tight ends. Um, they use him on the ball. They use him as a stack backer. Um, they use him, you know, in space. He's a he's a really really good player, and I think that that's allowed them to do a lot of things defensively. You just gave uh, a bunch of Titans fans PTSD recalling that Green Bay Packers game, Greg. Devontae Adams got a whole Courtyard Marriott commercial out of just just a just a couple of busted uh, busted coverages uh, by the Tennessee defense, and now it runs regularly on NFL Sundays, which always well, it's going to be interesting. I tell you, what's going to be interesting in that game? We know that the uh, offense for the Cards is very dynamic, yeah, um, and in fact, they they line up increasingly more each week out of ten personnel meeting four wide receivers because they've got four good ones um so i wonder we know aaron Rodgers is great but i wonder if given the lack of weapons if they could go into this game with the idea to kind of shorten the game and run the ball yeah you know i don't know the answer to that you know i know that's probably not the way aaron Rodgers would want to play but they just might not have the weapons to be dynamic and explosive in the pass game yeah, it sounds like the start of the Tennessee Titans season. Uh, Greg, what's uh, what's ahead on the NFL matchup show with you, Sal Pal, and Matt Bowen this weekend? Well, you know, it's not a great week of games, so we're actually going to do two what we call full segment games. And Tennessee and Indy is one. Okay. Um, I'm actually doing a piece on the past game of the Titans uh, because Matt did a piece on Derrick Henry a week ago. Um and we're also going to do the Chargers Patriots as a full segment game because that's a very intriguing game for the Patriots. They're on the road. Um, now, of course, no matter what the records are, Steelers Browns is always a big game and a worthy game. And um, I know Titans fans may not be as focused on the NFC as some, but the Cowboys Vikings is a very intriguing NFC game. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I think the the Vikings, I don't I don't necessarily want to say that they, they've been underrated, but it feels like people are just starting to pay attention to what they've been doing. Although I'm sure people like yourself who watch the film at great length have been noticing this be uh, become a trend throughout the course of the year. That's what's ahead on the NFL matchup show. Make sure that you set your DVRs for it and get ready for your NFL weekend with it, just as you do every week with us right here on the install. Greg, enjoy the week of uh, the football to come. And I, uh, I will, I'll, I'll take, I'll take the rest. Of, I'll let you have the rest of the afternoon and no longer disrupt your tape studies. until. <laughs> <next week. laughs> 
All right, Buck. I appreciate it. Love being with you. Thanks. Thanks, Greg.